to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ this is a faithful saying if a man desires the position of a bishop he desires a good work. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. Welcome to our study of 1 Timothy chapter 3 through 6. As always, the Gospel of Christ program is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. We're so glad that you've joined us to study the book of 1 Timothy with us. If you have a question or would like to study the Bible further, please check us out on the website, thegospelofchrist.com. All our audios and videos are free, available to you there free of charge. And if you've got a Bible question, you can email us or contact us with that, and we'd love to study the Word of God with you further. The book of 1 Timothy is all about proper church conduct. Paul said, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15. And so Paul, right off the bat, tells Timothy, I'm writing so that you can know how to conduct yourself. Church conduct then would not just be limited to inside the assembly. It's in the doctrine we teach. It's in our prayer and our dress, whether it's modest. It's in the qualification of elders, chapter 3. It's in the work of the minister, chapter 4. It's in our relation to and treatment of widows and whether we have love of money in our life or not. And so in every aspect of life, I've got to look at myself as a member of the Lord's body. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is going to deal with church conduct as it relates to the qualification and work of elders and deacons. There are both negative and positive qualifications that an elder must not and must possess to be pleasing to God. For example, right off the bat, Paul says to Timothy, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And so what's the first qualification of an elder? He needs to desire. He needs to have that desire to help win souls, to help lead people to Jesus, to shepherd the flock of God, Acts 20 verses 28 through 32, and to be responsible for those souls on the day of judgment, Hebrews chapter 13. Verse number 17. Let me mention just a couple of negative qualifications that are pointed out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The writer begins by noting in 1 Timothy 3 verse 3, Paul says that an elder is not to be given to wine. Now, marginal note in the King James Bible says, not ready to quarrel or all for wrong as one in wine. The American Standard Version says not a brawler. The idea here is that an elder cannot be one who imbibes alcohol or who has the disposition, the attitude, or the demeanor of one who, the way one acts when he drinks alcohol. And so it, it goes hand in hand with what Paul will say to Timothy, not violent, not soon angry, one who is in control of himself is the idea. So elders must have self-control. Sometimes accusations are made. Sometimes situations have to be dealt with that are emotional. Sometimes people may push their buttons. An elder must know how to control himself. Another negative qualification that is mentioned in 1 Timothy 3 is an elder must not be quarrelsome. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 3. While the term is similar to the idea of not given to wine, it also suggests that an elder is not to always be controversial or overly argumentative, not just arguing for argument's sake. Must we stand up for truth? Absolutely. We've got to contend earnestly for the faith. Paul will say to Titus that elders are to stop the mouths of false teachers. 
We're not to have, we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we're to expose them. And so, yes, you've got to defend the truth. Yes, you've got to stand up for what's right. But arguing? Just for the sake of argument, being quarrelsome, one who's looking to pick a fight, or one who's always wanting to get in a battle, that's not the attitude that an elder needs to have. Then he mentions a couple of more that we make note of, and that is, and both of these are along the same lines. Elders must not be greedy for money, not covetous. 1 Timothy 3.3 3 and Titus 1 verse 7. The idea here is that they're not a lover of monies. Elders are not in the money-making, money-hoarding business. They're not just big accountants. That's not what they are. Elders are in the business of saving souls. This world and all that's in it is one day going to be burned up. 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12. Do not love the world or the things in the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. And so instead of getting caught up in the things of this world and the money and the stuff and the junk that is so uh, easy to get to, that is so materialistic minded, elders are to be spiritual minded. Not greedy for money, not covetous, not about things of this world, rather about the things of God. Elders, as we think about some of their positive qualifications just briefly, the Bible says they're to be blameless, they're to be of good behavior, they're to be just or holy. These are all qualities of their character. Blameless doesn't mean sinless. It means that when sin is found in their life, there can't be any blame laid because they've taken care of it. The way Jesus said, Luke 13, 3, by repenting. That they're to be holy, they're to be just, they're to be upright, they're to be an example to the believers. In every way, elders ought to stand out as people who are striving to live for Christ in every way. They're to be temperate or sober-minded. That is, they think seriously about the things of God, about holy things, and about things that must deal with the spiritual nature of the Lord's church. And then, of course, we have this qualification. They're to have a good testimony among those who are outside. They're to be hospitable. That is, how do people of the world view them? Do they have a good testimony? What's their standing in the community? How are their business dealings? How do their friends look at them? How do their acquaintances and people that they relate to every day? Do they have a good report among those outside the Lord's body? Do even people of the world recognize that they're trying to do the right thing? Are they hospitable? Are they willing to open up their home? Are they willing to help strangers and do good to those around them? Are they lovers of what is good? Are they apt to teach, able to teach? You see, an elder ought to be a spiritual leader. As a spiritual leader, he wants to promote good. He wants that good to be seen in other members' lives. And he wants to be able to, must be able to, to teach that to those around so that they can know that they truly are faithful to Almighty God. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 then, moving on from the qualifications of elders and deacons and the work that they are designed to do there, Paul then mentions to Timothy some things about the aspect of the gospel preacher. He begins by saying, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. He'll go on to say that these people have their conscience seared with a hot iron. What do we know about false teachers and false teaching? The Holy Spirit said, He expressly said that it would come. False teachers have existed for a long time. They will continue to exist. Jesus promised this. Paul said this. The Spirit expressly says. And some of these people have no ability to feel, have no conscience or emotion. Their conscience has actually been seared with a hot iron. Now he mentions that some of those teachers in that day were teaching ungodly things, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. You know, when we think about things that are taught that are contrary to the will of God, these are a couple that just Paul mentions, and we can add to that, but the forbidding to marry, 
Where's that at in Scripture? There's no celibate life in Scripture. A person could choose to do that of his own accord, but there's no command. You can't command that. There's no command to abstain from certain foods. Now, we find that men today impose those commands on certain people, but not God. The Bible says that marriage is honorable among all. Hebrews 13, 4, the bad undefiled, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Acts chapter 10, not really in the context of foods, but he uses that as an illustration. What God has called clean, don't call unclean. God's called it common, don't call it unclean. God will say to Peter in the vision, and of course, 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5 tells us why. It's sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. Now for just a moment, Paul then deals with Timothy's work as a young evangelist and the things that he needs to work on and do so that he can be pleasing to God in every way. Paul will say, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness it's profitable for all things. 1 Timothy 4 verses 7 through 10. And so when we think about things that are profitable, Bodily exercise, that'll help you a little, make your body healthy. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But where's the real profit? Godliness. Profitable for all things. Timothy, I want you to focus on working out in the spiritual sense, is what Paul says. What's that mean? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3 verse 18, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. We as Christians are to launch out into the deep. Hebrews 5 verse 4, you can't always stay in the shallow surface of Christianity. You've got to grow and mature as a child of God. Search the Scriptures daily. Acts 17, 11, be ready to give an answer. 1 Peter 3 verse 15, really live and stand behind what you believe. Now, why is it that godliness is profitable for all things? Two reasons having promise of the life which now is, and that which is to come. Why is godliness profitable? The promise of the life that now is. That is, there's no greater life than the Christian life. Do you remember the words of Jesus? John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life, and that you may have it more abundantly. And then, of course, eternal life. 1 John 2, verse 25, this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. And so, grow spiritually. Work out in godliness. Develop and mature as a Christian because of the best life now and the best life in the hereafter, eternal life with God our Father. Now, as we think, though, about being a Christian, as we think about living the way God wants us to, let's remember that all of us are being looked at. All Christians ought to be and are examples to the world. Look at what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, notice verse number 12. The scripture says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. We as Christians, and here's a young person. Timothy is a young man, and Paul says to him, don't let anybody despise your youth. Don't let them look down on you and say, oh, he's young, he doesn't know anything. No, rather, the encouragement here for all of us and for even young people is be an example in your word by speaking as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, verse 11, in faith and conduct by the way we act by the way we deal with life's difficulties, by trusting God in spirit and love and purity in every way. Our life ought to be an example. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1? Paul said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. The scripture says we're to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse number 21. And so I need to be an example. Uh, think of the words of Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, then Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that for you to save yourself 
and others, there's one thing you've got to do. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 16. The scripture says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will both save yourself and all those who hear you. What's Paul's encouragement to Timothy about saving his own soul and the soul of others? Take heed to yourself. What's that mean? Paul said, I discipline my body, bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I should become a castaway. Taking heed to yourself means watch out. Be careful how you live. The way you speak, the way you act, the way people see us. We as Christians need to be very careful that we do take heed to ourself, and then notice this, and to the doctrine. Friend, doctrine or teaching is important. Second John 9, whoever does not continue in the doctrine of Christ, he doesn't even have God as his Father. And so doctrine just simply means teaching uh, the commands of Jesus, those commands that have the power to save, Romans 1, 16. It's not enough just to do those at one time. You've got to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 10. And so I take heed to myself, I take heed to the doctrine, and notice this, and I must continue in them. This is not just point in time action. This is ongoing action. 1 John 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light, we must run the race, 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 6. We've got to fight the good fight of faith. All those are, are ongoing images, running the race, fighting the fa fight, uh, being faithful unto death. Continue in the things which we've been taught, and then we'll be faithful unto God and live true to Him in each and every way. 1 Timothy chapter 5 then, now Paul is going to discuss with Timothy about having respect and love inside the church and how we ought to love one another and the obligations that we have to people in the Lord's church. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 5. I want you to see what Paul says beginning in verse number 1. The scripture says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. And so much like Titus chapter 2, Paul is now going to discuss various classes of people, the older, the younger, older men, younger men, older women, younger women, and how our relationship is supposed to be with them. He begins by talking to us about one class of people that Christians especially ought to be mindful of. We're to do good unto all men. Galatians 6 verse 10. We're to take care of the widows and the orphans in their affliction. James 1 verse 7. And here's an example of that. 1 Timothy chapter 5. A true widow must be honored and taken care of by the Lord's church and the Lord's people. I want you to notice 1 Timothy 5 verses 4 and 5. The scripture says, beginning in verse 3, Honor widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. What about the relationship of the church to the widows? Not everybody who's lost a spouse fits into the class of widows that the church should bring in, support, and take care of. For example, Paul will say in verse 4, if she's got living children, here's the responsibility. Children are to repay their parents. They're to honor their father and mother, Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. Just like in the Old Testament, it's the children's responsibility first and foremost. They're to take care of the parents. Parents are not just to be pushed to the side. Look at all they did. This is about respect and honor for parents who've been godly parents, who have raised children, how we ought to treat them and love them as the Bible says. And then verse 5, the true widow is one who doesn't have anybody to take care of her, one whose only hope and trust is in God and every Christian 
ought to have the responsibility and desire to help that person to really encourage and to uplift and meet their needs as James chapter 1 verse 27 says. Now, I want you to notice though what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5 verses 7 and 8 about this widow. The scripture says, And these things command that they may be blameless, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. These are commands of God, not just suggestions or ideas. We're to take care of our own. And Paul says, here's the strength with which he says this. If one won't take care of his own family, you talk about a sorry individual, won't even take care of his own family, God says he's denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. He doesn't believe the book. He doesn't believe the scriptures. He doesn't have faith and trust in God because this book, the book of faith, Romans 1, 16 and 17, teaches us to take care of our family, to honor those who are really widows and to let the church help them as they can and to give God the honor and glory that He deserves. Among the classes of people who are deserving of honor, Paul then mentions in 1 Timothy 5, verse number 17, that elders who are working diligently and preaching and teaching especially, they're worthy of honor. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. The Bible says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. The work of an elder is indeed a work. For Paul says, let the elders who labor well, those who especially labor in word and doctrine, be counted worthy of double honor. We say thank you and thank you again for the great job they've done. Why? Because they're laboring. They're, they're teaching. They're encouraging. They're going from house to house. They're visiting the sick and the shut-ins. They're setting up Bible studies. They're trying to shepherd the flock of God, 1 Peter 5. They're really concerned. They're weeping at soul over souls who are in danger. They're encouraging those who need encouragement. That's the work of an elder. It's not just a, a title to wear. It's not just a position to feel. It's a work to be performed every day trying to save souls and encourage people to follow Jesus in this life. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul is going to discuss our conduct as it relates to the things of this world, especially of a finan financial nature. Notice 1 Timothy 6 beginning in verse number 6. Paul will say concerning this world and its stuff, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall in temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What's one of the greatest joys in this world? To learn to be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, when I think of this, I think of the opposite side of that. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21, that man who spent his life building down barns, tearing down barns, building up barns, uh, making the almighty dollar for himself more and more. God said to that man, you fool. And here was the point. So is he who is rich, but not toward God. Luke chapter 12, verse 20 and 21. You know, when I think about the things of this world that really matter, it's not how much money we have. It's not how big our home is or how big our car is or how big our bank account is. It's the joy we possess as a child of God. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present world not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Christians have a home promised in heaven. 
we can live in that place Jesus went to prepare for us. John 14, 1 through 6, that, that place where there remains a rest for the people of God. But to do that, I've got to learn to be content. And I've got to not have a love of money which is a root of all kind of evil. Money won't save you. Jesus said, what will it profit if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what? Shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You, you can't do anything to save your soul related to money. Money itself cannot save you. Well, what then must you do? You've got to fight the good fight. Notice Paul's encouragement to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. The scripture says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Don't ever give up. Fight that fight. Keep resisting the devil. Keep saying no to sin. Keep staying with the book and keeping error away. Keep doing everything possible to keep the devil at bay. Fight the good fight. Paul said, lay hold of eternal life. That ought to be our desire each and every day. More than anything, do you want to go to heaven? If so, fight the fight. Don't give up. You know, in fighting a fight, it's not always easy. You got, might get punched. You might get kicked. You might get knocked down. There may be difficulties that come along the way, but what separates us from people of the world is we have something worth getting up for and fighting the fight all over again. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, but not to me only, all those who have loved disappearing. Friend, are you fighting the good fight of faith? If you're a child of God, are you staying faithful to the Lord? Are you working diligently? Are you striving to help others get to heaven? Are you every day looking to be a light to the world? If so, then look at the promise you have. And may God help each of us to never give up fighting the good fight of faith. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1 855 458 3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.